Hello everyone and welcome to today's Dynamics 365 Tech Talk. Today's topic is servicing, supporting, and maintaining Dynamics 365 finance and operations apps. My name is Tim and I will be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this session through Teams live events and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. This session is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. When you join this event, your name, email address, and or phone number may be viewable by other session participants in the Q&A panel. By joining, you are agreeing to this experience. The recording will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. If you have questions for our presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions in the Q&A panel throughout the session and at the end if we have time remaining. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Davey uh, Vliegen, Senior R&D Solution Architect. Davey, over to you. Thank you, Tim, and hello, everyone. Today's topic is servicing, supporting, and maintaining the Dynamics 365 finance operations apps production instances. And with me today, I have two of my colleagues, Christopher Lim and Febben, and they're able uh, to answer all your questions throughout the session. So please do not hold off until the end of the session, but just ask them when they come to your mind. First, a small advertisement. So for the Dynamics 365 implementation guide, I hope a lot of you are already aware of this uh, great book and the link is in this slide deck and the slide deck will be shared with you after the tech talk. Um, special attention to the chapter operate and this chapter you can find two sections. One is service to solution and one is transition to support. And these two sections, they're really, yeah, Really what, what is also mentioned today in the tech talk. So that's why I highlight the importance of, of the operate chapter. But of course, yeah, the entire book more for the implementation point of view is also a great knowledge. So let's start now with the tech talk for today. So we have three topics. One is servicing, one is supporting, and we will end with maintaining. Let's start with the servicing part. Before we do that, I first want to highlight the uh, service activity responsibilities because Microsoft provides support for the infrastructure, the platform, the standard solution, and Microsoft will also monitor the production instance 24 by 7 and keep them in a healthy state. But on the other hand, you also have customer supported by implementation partner and there's also some resp responsibilities from, from your end. So if you think about identity configuration and management, as well as uh, user and data specific security, customer is also responsible for customizations and also really important the end-to-end -end testing of the business processes prior to a new deployment or prior to a service update, correct? So your regression testing. For these reasons, it's really important to understand that it's a joint responsibility and there is a link and you will see in this tech talk a lot of times the learn more section at the bottom of the slide. And here is a link to the service activity responsibilities. In the past, it was like a separate PDF document. Now we have it published on docs re recently. So our service operation guide and in there we have also more details around service activity responsibilities. So please have a look at it and, and just review the different responsibilities. So why is all that important and why do we have this joint responsibility? So as Microsoft, we are definitely committed to build a scalable platform and also services on top of it. So if you think about the infrastructure, servers, databases, the whole Azure infrastructure and the standard solution, correct? The standard apps. But then you have, of course, during the implementation phase, there are additional building blocks added so each and every customer has their own specific business processes. Also specific set of users accessing the 365 apps from different devices. There's probably almost no apps out that are completely standard. So, or you have some ISV solutions, or you also have some customization extension code on top of it. 
The integration part is different from customer to customer as well as the reporting part and the whole uh, analytical uh, intelligence, correct? And then the last part is the data itself. So the data constellation, it's also different from business to business. So if you add all these building blocks on top of it, I think you understand that it cannot be a task solely to Microsoft to keep the Dynamics 365 finance operation apps in a healthy state. So we have to join forces here. The tool set that uh, we are using for the servicing part is actually the same tool set you should already be familiar with because it starts already during the onboarding that you use the lifecycle services, which is a collaboration portal. Um, but then also during the implementation phase of your uh, project, you have already utilized LCS, lifecycle services. But then when, once you're live for the monitoring part, we come back to that later in the presentation, but as well as the servicing part, you also will use LCS. So I'm not going to detail to each and every tool. There are separate docs articles, and, and I also refer to, to the links. I'm with the links here in the slide to these docs articles. But now I mentioned LCS, but because the finance operation apps, like if we think about project operations, if you think about dual write and some specific add-ins, they're running on top of both the finance operation platform as well the dataverse. So that means also that you as a customer or supporting partner need to make yourself familiar with the Power Platform Admin Center, which is called as well referred to as PPEC, correct? So this session, I will highlight also a few times some specifics around the Power Platform Admin Center, but I also will refer to docs articles and also another tech talk, which is on my next slide here at the bottom. If you want to learn more about how to do administration with the Power Platform Admin Center. If we talk about the servicing scenarios, so most of the servicing scenarios nowadays are self-service actions, but some, some of them still need to be addressed by a support ticket. And for LCS specific, there are still a few actions that are handled uh, through a service request, not a support ticket, but a service request. So we're now going to highlight in the next slides a few more specific LCS service actions in more detail. As mentioned before, for the Power Platform Admin Center, I refer to the Tech Talk, um, which you can find the link below. So if we think about servicing scenarios, self-service action LCS, so these are the majority of, of all the servicing actions, correct? They're self-service. It started already with the deployment of a new environment, but also when you do a new package application. So when you service your environment, it's through self-service action. Also database movement operations. Think about you have a production instance and you want to refresh the data in your sandbox or in your pre-prod environment, correct? That's a self-service action. There are also other things that are self-service like pause upcoming updates, which I will come to in more detail in the later slides as well some specific SQL actions, although they are limited, but you could, for example, if you're really in a critical situation, you could end a certain uh, SQL session. Again, there are links downstairs uh, with more details. There's still also a few uh, service request types in LCS today, but like I said, there are just some limited uh, number of requests of types that you can do. So again, I refer to the docs with the latest information on what still is like, uh, what you can still uh, reach out to us through a service request. But in general, the rule is if there is no self-service action, then and it's not something that is documented as, as a service request type on docs, then you have to lock a support ticket. That's the way to reach out to, to Microsoft at that moment. Uh, one very common one is you're doing regression testing for a new service update and you 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 flag it if you find out a regression and you want to make us aware of that that's uh, typically some some reason to open a support ticket correct there could be other one and one other important i want to highlight is before you go live you fill in a subscription estimator and you estimate their load that will be on your future d365 finance operation apps but if you know that there is a 
business expansion or you know that you have a big country rollout, for example, and you know that the load will increase drastically in the next couple of weeks, then it's also good to make us aware of that. And you should do that. You should then at that moment create a new subscription estimator and you can do that yourself. But then to mark that new one as active, you have to open a support ticket. And that's also again all documented in the docs articles. Some words about the database backup and retention. So databases are protected by automatic backups. And for production, it's important to, to know that there is a retention period of 28 days. And for the sandbox environments, that is a retention period of only seven days. Just that you are aware of this. If you need uh, backups for longer, uh, for longer time than the retention period, you have to take care of it yourself, correct? By refreshing the data in a certain sandbox and then offline that data uh, to a safe storage. We have a service level agreement, so we are committed for an uptime of the service on a monthly basis of 99.9%. Regarding the backup and uh, and also the, the backup and restore, I want to highlight one important aspect if you have a dual write enabled environment. So because if you have dual write enabled, then there is a one on one link between finance operation and the data first environment. And if you're in a certain scenario, for example, where you want to uh, restore a production database into a sandbox, you can do that, correct? You have self-service actions for that. But it's important to, to know that with this operations that you will not clean up automatically the dual write configurations. So there is a specific docs article, and I know this slide is, is very detailed, but I think it's better to go through the link in the docs article where you can read about how to unlink and relink to do a right environments after that you did that restore or refresh of databases in your environments. Then about business continuity continuity with uh, which we call our high availability and disaster recovery feature. So this is a responsibility for Microsoft. So we are responsible to create a secondary site, correct? And to have that uh, up and running in case of a disaster. There are two differences if we talk about failover, or two main ones, I would say. That could be a planned failover. That's when we foresee that there is a problem in a certain data center or Azure region due to <clears throat> that we know, for example, that, that there is some, some upcoming, I don't know, weather forecast that we know some some data center is at risk due to weather conditions, then we could proactively fail over some of the instances or the production instances to a different region. And at that moment, because everything is done in a proactive way, there is no data loss. The other that could happen, and hopefully not often, is the unplanned failover when you have an anticipated region wide outage, for example, and at that moment, Customers will be notified of that, of course, but we need to at that moment fail over through also another region. And at that moment, there might be some uh, data loss. And specifically for the finance operation apps, it could also, it's also the case that there is some reduced functionality when that critical disaster will happen. So things like financial reporting and Power BI reporting would not be automatically available at that time. And if you still need to have them available, then you have to grow to the support to, to make them active again uh, during that uh, disaster. In the event of a data loss, then customers might also have to provide a written, written sign off to, to trigger the failover and also to trigger the failover back to the primary region. So now this is a lot of information that you can learn more about this by a detailed docs article, so which I pasted here about business continuity and disaster recovery. As well, there is quite lengthy description in this service description guide, which I already mentioned has been recently published to docs. If you want to, uh, you can view actually the health of your all your Microsoft services, but also including the Dynamics 365 services on the service help page in the admin center. So if you experience problems with the cloud service and it's very good always to check 
uh, there and you can also get automatic notifications. So you know already it's a known issue before you reach out to, to support. Of course, you can still lock a support ticket or production outage, and we will come to that in the next section of this presentation. But practically, or, or before you do that, you could already see if there is, for example, a region-wide outage in one of the data centers. And specific about finance operation service updates, before we do that, it's important to understand the difference between quality update and service update. So they're both cumulative updates, correct? So there are no individual fixes. That's the same between both of them. The differences for a quality update, they're just a limited set of fixes for known issues, I would say critical issues, uh, on the same version that you have currently installed. So if you see on the screenshot here at the moment uh, on the right side, in this environment, and I can see that in LCS environment details, the version is 10.020 and you can see the detailed build number. You can see that there is a quality update available, the same version number, but a higher build number, correct? So the delta between this build number and your currently installed build number are some KBs, some critical fixes, and you can see more details if you hit that view, if you view update button, correct? The other, op the other um, updates are service updates, correct? Service updates, you can see here downstairs in this view, although I am in 1020, there is a 1021 available. The difference with service updates is that not only it's a higher version number, but also it con contains new features, correct? And it contains new features and functionality. About features, um, Features are added and updated in every release, but the feature management experience, and you can see a link here downstairs on the slide to a feature management overview, because the feature management experience it provides like a workspace where you can view then a list of features that have been delivered in a certain release. And you can then use this workspace to view the feature documentation and to enable and disable certain features. So it's really important when you do a service update to a next release, that you also check the feature management and that you go through that list and select the features that, that are maybe interesting for your business or one that you can benefit from and that you also take that up in your regression testing. Right? With service updates, one last difference is that if you are not uh, updating yourself and you do not stay current yourself, then it's also the ones that we as Microsoft will push to the production environments and the sandbox environments as well, and we will automatically update you at a certain stage. So if you think about the service updates and you look at the picture on the right side, we have eight updates delivered per year. So it's monthly, but it's not every month, correct? For example, like a holiday season, and you can see the months when we normally release one. You can, if you have the ability to pause uh, updates and you can pause up to three consecutive monthly updates. Even you have the ability to pause, it's not a recommendation. Because it's also important to understand that uh, the serviceability or that we can only service the current version. So that's the one that is released. That's the N version in the picture here and the previous version, the N minus one. So that means then when you have 1020 and 1021 came out at that moment, you can still, of the 1020 is still under service, correct? But at the moment the 1022 will come out, then only 1022 and 1021 can be serviced and the 1020 will be out of service. It means that when you run into an issue, when you're still in 1020 and you have the ability to pause three consecutive updates, so okay, that's okay from that part. You can log a support ticket and if there is a critical issue and there is already fix available, of course you can install that fix. But if there is no fix available and our product group uh, still need to create uh, a fix, that fix can only be created then on the N and N minus one version. That means that in a critical situation, you will be forced at that moment to update and still you also need to do your regression testing. So that becomes a very uh, stressful situation. So that's why it's really important to, to stay current. Uh, I cannot emphasize this enough. 
and also to invest in automated regression tests because if you have to update at least two times per year but recommended to do it much more often that also means that you need to do regression testing of all your business processes before that you take up this in production and if this is a manual effort it is uh, very time consuming and very expensive so you have to start investing in regression testing and that could be with our set our standard out of the box tool, but could also be with any other tool that you're familiar with or you're a customer already utilizing. In LCS itself, in the project settings, there you have the update settings, and it's important that you as a customer or the supporting party knows uh, the screen, where to find it, and also how to, uh, to, to make sure it's current. So if you look at the sandbox update environment, this is what I call the pre-prod environment. So this is the environment that will be automatically updated if you don't take the updates in your own hand seven days before that we update production. So it's really important to select the correct one there. And then you have the update cadence and the update cadence you can then select at what which week of that month uh, and the certain time zone, certain day of the week and a time slot that you want the update to happen. And it's like a three hour window. Like I mentioned, there is ability to pause and could be typically definitely, for example, for a new release or a new big rollout, you want to pause because you did all your testing and you want to have a stable uh, situation uh, from a cold perspective uh, before that, that you go live and during the first weeks after go live. So there are moments that you want to pause and you can do that. Here's a slider. And then in the view to update calendar, you will see then in more detail what are the next upcoming uh, updates and the, which one you have paused, correct? And like I mentioned, you can pause up to three consecutive updates, but it's not recommended. Commerce update specific, so applying updates and extensions specifically here to cloud scale units that follows the same principles as the deployment to the back office. So everything that I told before is also applicable for the cloud scale units. A few small remarks here is uh, for cloud scale units. If you um, think about you want to update certain stores that are located in a certain region worldwide uh, at the downtime window when stores are closed and back offices also um, not working, then it's good to create a cloud scale units per region, correct? In this example here, you have one in West Europe, one in West US. So that makes that the servicing a bit easier because you can then select the downtime window, which is uh, yeah, the best one for a specific reason when stores are, for example, not operating. Uh, there's an additional uh, thing you could also implement, which what we call a safe deployment approach. Of course, this for this, you need then an additional cloud scale unit, but if you have an additional cloud scale unit and some pilot stores pointing to that cloud scale unit, you could first update this one, see if everything is, is fine and, and working as expected in the pilot stores, and then you can afterwards update the other cloud scale units. If you want to learn more about this, I refer here again to these uh, docs articles. Specific for dual write environments. So if you have again environments that have dual write enabled and you will update them. So there is an update that you want to service them. That's fine, but you need to make sure that you uh, have minimum impact to, to users. So there is some alert notification. Uh, you should be familiar with and there is also some uh, automated action that you can do to, to make sure that the, the integration is paused and that the, the messages are queued as long as the servicing is ongoing. And then later on, you can resume it again. So this could be like in a servicing scenario, but it's also useful, for example, in an unplanned maintenance scenario where you want to temporarily hold off the integration. So it's important to understand that at the moment the messages are not lost, but they're somehow queued. And whenever that app recovered or the servicing is finished, then you can just resume. If you want to learn more about error management alert notification for dual write environments, uh, please read the docs article. Then recently we also had, uh, if we have more and more uh, microservices released, think about the planning optimization service. 
inventory visibility service. The cadence of the updates here is different than what I told you before for the finds operation apps. So the, the update cadence is also much more frequently, could even go on a weekly basis. At the moment, the information that is surfaced in LCS, or this information actually is not even surfaced in LCS at the moment, or through release nodes. Um, but it's also important to understand that if there are notable changes, and if there are changes to the microservice that would impact your business, of course, at that moment, we will communicate, correct? We will communicate at that moment through release nodes and other channels, and you will be made aware of it, so you also have a chance to, to test your business processes. Uh, when we update microservices, how it works at this moment is that when we update production, we update sandbox environments at the same time. So it's different than what I told before for the microservices than for the, the apps itself. And that's why it is so important to always read all communication that comes from LCS. So it should not go, go to your trash bin folder in Outlook. So there should be some people in your organization, the one that are supporting the fines operation apps that, that uh, are familiar with communication coming from LCS and that also read this communication. And sometimes you really have to also take action if there is some ask to take action. So if there are finance operation updates, if there is a feature release or feature deprecation, all this communication comes through LCS. So to summarize this, this chapter, what we talked about was about the service availability of 99.9%. .9%. Um, uh, you should be aware of backup retention, correct? And then for service request execution is varies a bit and the details are in the docs articles, but it's it's always less than eight hours. And if you have to do servicing to the FNO apps, there is a downtime window of uh, three hours and the update frequency is monthly. But like I mentioned here as well on the slide, monthly actually means eight service updates per year and ability to pause three consecutive monthly updates. So if you do, so you have to plan the service updates and you have to pause at the right moment. Even that you can pause, you should only pause by exception. You should be familiar of the update LCS update settings and make sure that everything is current there. So you're not get unexpectedly be, get an update, for example, on your production. You should be aware of dual write enabled environment servicing specifics. And you should also read communication and take appropriate actions to communication that comes from LCS. And the last thing I want to mention again is that automatic regression testing, RSET or any other tool is extremely important. And the link to RSET uh, you can find at the bottom of this slide. So this concludes the first chapter about uh, servicing. So the next one is supporting. So of course, if you think about support then your partner or whatever party you have your contract with is your first line of defense when you need support. So they can provide functional technical information. Sometimes it's the same partner than you had as well during the implementation phase. So this is your first line of defense. But if you have to then think about other support content channels in Microsoft, then the first one I want to highlight are the task guides, which is sort of a conceptual help within the contextual help, sorry, within the app itself and give some guidance, some training to new empl employees. So this is the task guides. Then you have LCS a few times mentioned already and LCS you also use for support case management or if you have to report a production outage. I come back to that in one of the next slides. Then the docs articles, docs pages is where the official documentation goes in, correct? As well as information about the roadmap, upcoming features. So I already referred to a lot of docs articles in this tech talk. Then the learn page, so the self-based uh, learning, actually training that are available there. So it's really also important uh, content information. And then tech talks like the one you listen today, like these live webinars, but as well later on they will be recorded and they will be available on the community site. Then the team blocks where uh, on the team blocks itself on the community site, you can uh, learn more about features, for example, or have some uh, chats with product teams. 
as well as some community forums as well on the community side where you can ask specific questions, maybe also questions where not typically support type of questions, but maybe more in the implementation phase that you want to have some guidance. So you could also use then these community channels to, to share your experience and to get input from others. And that again is also the place on the community side where the tech talks uh, will be published like this one. Then if you have to reach out to, to Microsoft, then the main channel here is Microsoft support. And as part of the D365 Fans Operation apps of the D365 subscription, you, you have subscription based support as part of that. But if you need some additional services, then professional direct or unified support contracts will be maybe more applicable for your business. For unified, it's not support, it's not only for D365, but it then covers also all your other Microsoft technologies. In the next slide, I know this is very uh, detailed. I think it's the best that you go after the tech talk uh, to the link that I put here at the bottom, and then there you can download the PDF where the screenshot comes from. I just pasted it here because I think it's important that if you think about the different support contracts, that could be like, like then there is some difference in SLA, but also the more you go towards professional direct and unified advanced performance contracts, you also get a lot of additional proactive services and you also get a customer success account manager assigned. And that's also really beneficial that you have this direct contact to reach out to for additional questions, support. So when you log a support request, it's really important that you select the right severity. This is severity C, it starts from there. The impact is minimal, but severity B, that's already a sensitive issue and there is some impact on the business. And then you come to severity A, where there is really some critical business process is no longer working, so business is affected. And then the, the, the top one, I, you're at the bottom of the slide, but the one with the highest severity is the production outage, correct? And your entire or a big part of, of your, your business processes are no longer working and your business is hurt a lot. So for the production outage, we also always ask if you have a unified support contract to inform your customer success account manager. Um, and for severity A as well of production outages is also expected that not only Microsoft, but also the customer uh, or the supporting party is working actually constantly so together 24 by 7 around the sun uh, so when you when you have a CFA or production outage you should also willing to to work on a 24 by 7. So how to submit an issue to Microsoft support as well specifically for report a production outage you can find uh, more details in the docs articles below. So this is not an ALM session, but I have one slide here regarding ALM for emergency patching. Um, and that's for me uh, important here to highlight because in case of an emergency situation, you might need to, to debug, for example, um, the production data, or it could also be in a business critical situation that you have to do some emergency patch patching, like there is a KBE, there is a quality fix available, or you created a fix, uh, <coughs> in your custom code. So at that moment you need to do some emergency patching and it's really important at that moment to have the environments available, correct? So in this example here on the uh, slide here, on the left side, yeah, it's your, your, your DevOps setup, correct? With different branching. But then the one here at the bottom here, this is actually the flow which is supporting my production. And the sandbox four, you can call it easily here the pre-prod environment is always at the same code base and has a recent copy of production data. And the sandbox four is the one then where you can test your, your fix immediately, your emergency fix, where you could also debug through this uh, database on this environment here if you need to debug a critical uh, issue that is maybe uh, data related. It's important also mention that the build servers here could be optional and it could be replaced by Microsoft hosted agents and Azure pipelines. And more, for more information about all of this, I refer to a very interesting tech talk here at the bottom regarding uh, development uh, ALM. There's some other interesting articles as well on this slide. So a support uh, 
production sample approach in this slide. So you can see here at the top, you have the hot part. So it will start after the incident has been declared, correct? And there is a triage followed by pre-investigation, investigation in the end, a solution finding. And when the solution is found at that moment, uh, that the solution has been found and, in, and implemented, then the customer is unblocked and the incidents can be mitigated at that moment. The risk, however, uh, is still there because the risk for reoccurrence, however, remains. That's why there is the cold path at the bottom. So for critical production issues, a root cause analysis need to be done. And after the root cause has been found, a long-term protection plan that needs to be in place to make sure that the issue will not reoccur. Once that one is in place, then the risk is fully mitigated. So there is a difference here between incident mitigated and also the risk on top of that being mitigated. So to establish all of this in a smooth way, you should have the right actors in place and you should also have uh, the processes defined, including also the description of the tools to use. I want to illustrate this a bit more in a sample. So I have a sample of fast IT and slow IT. So first of all, a fast IT team. So let's say that an end user reports an issue and on day zero and the end user doesn't know exactly there are no templates available so sorry in this case fast it the templates are available and that means that very efficiently the end user can report the issue and because there is this alm for emergency patching also available um, there's a pre-prod environment available the troubleshooting can also start very fast that also means that the pre-investigation and the investigation itself that is then pointing to in this case in this example to a faulty customization that that one can also be found quite quickly and also a hotfix or emergency patch can be created already in day two because the environment is there to test that means in the same day as well the whole environment like the, the whole regression testing can happen in the pre-prod environment there is also automated testing in place and then on day three already the fix could be deployed into production. So in a fast IT team approach between declaring the issue by the end user and having the issue of the issue mitigated in production is here just three days. If you compare that with the uh, slow IT, then the end user reports an issue without using the correct templates or it doesn't aware of any templates how he should log an issue. So he just mentioned, okay, it's slow. Of course, already at that level, at that triage level, at the first line support, some additional information needs to be asked. There's a lack of tools to be used to collect the right information. So it takes a few days before that even the investigation can start. And then that in investigation part by that team is very limited. And very uh, after yeah, the same day already, they open a case, a support ticket with Microsoft. and. Microsoft start investigation is missing critical information, is asking more details, team doesn't know immediately how to provide that information. So the solution finding takes a lot of days, day five, day seven. Then at day seven, then Microsoft points to a faulty customization. It's the same example as in the fast IT, but here is just, yeah, with a different and not an ideal approach. So at that moment, Microsoft reports this uh, back to the project team. Then project team needs to start preparing the fix. It doesn't have the emergency patching LM set up, so that takes some time to have the environment in the right environment. Maybe there's no regression testing in place, so the testing itself before it can be deployed in production also takes longer. So you can see for the same issue reported, going from three days, you easily go for 10, 12 days or even longer. So when you log a support ticket, also in your internal support organization, but as well when you report to Microsoft, it's really important to, to have a quality input, correct? To always mention the environment where it occurs, the process itself, the reproduction steps and the expected versus the actual result. Then there is some pre-investigation that you maybe already that you want to share. And then it's also important to add additional information like screenshots, uh, videos and error messages, as well as the session IDs. Session IDs are maybe even additional user ID and, and trace information. For if it's a high severity issue like severity A or a production outage, 
then you always have to mention the business impact. So what is the impact for your business as well as the finance financial impact? So I want to end with some do's. So it's really important to have a solid support process in, in place, but also a clear escalation path. That you of that you have a team trained to that knows how to support the Dynamics 365 finance operation apps that do also the necessary pre-investigation, initial troubleshooting before reaching out to, to Microsoft. And if you have a specific support contract, then you can reach out to your customer success account manager or dedicated support engineer. If you have any escalated support tickets or bugs that maybe do not move or support tickets that do not move as you think they should. So, so far we talked about the servicing part and the supporting part. So now I want to end with the last part of this presentation, which is maintaining. For this part, uh, first uh, again highlight a few tools. So inside LCS, you also have monitoring and, and diagnostic tools available. You should be all familiar with. So it's recommended that you have like a routine to proactively check uh, the telemetry that is available there, maybe on a weekly basis. And there are some different tops that are available in this environment monitoring, correct? And again, a quick overview because there are some more detailed uh, docs articles describing each and every action. So there is an overview uh, page starting with this timeline here and some detailed user about user and activity load. There is an activity uh, top page and I don't have screenshots here, but if you click on that, you have pre-canned pre queries where there is some specific analysis that you can do. Like recently we added, for example, some related to throttling where you can see, for example, your throttled events. Then you have the help metrics, things like SQL deadlock info or other uh, AOS memory usage are, are still there. And then on the SQL insights, you have three different sub top pages. First of all, you have uh, the queries. There you can see today like the current blocking tree or blocking statements and currently running queries. And then under SQL action, there is ability to end a certain uh, SQL process. Again, only in an emergency situation, it's not a normal behavior that you have to go there and end on a daily or weekly basis uh, SQL processes, correct? It's just an, an, an emergency situation, an action you could do to continue your business. And again, yeah, reach out then to support team to investigate. And then there's also a live view under SQL Insights where you can see your current executing and blocking statements. Again, for more details, I refer to the docs articles on this slide. Like mentioned before, because we have now apps that run both on the Finds Operation platform as well as on Dataverse, that means also that you should be familiar about monitoring diagnostic tools on the Power Platform Admin Center that are and one, there are several, but one that I want to highlight, the most common one is the Dataverse Analytics, which is part of the Power Platform Admin Center. Um, if you want to learn more, again, there is a link. Just want to highlight a few things like, first of all, there is monitoring adoption, adoption and use. So things like what are my most active users? What are my workflows running? Things like that you can find on the page. And that's also what you, the screenshot uh, that you see here. The other one is if you go under capacity, then you can manage storage and performance. So you can see your storage quota and storage use, your top tables and size, for example. And if you then want to drill down more into details of your, I don't know, you found some top failing workflows, then you can also use this tool for to, to quickly analyze and diagnose and troubleshoot errors. So it's important to understand that next to the LCS set of tools, if you run as well um, some some of some of the apps that also run partly on Dataverse, that you make yourself available with the uh, make yourself familiar with the monitoring and diagnostic tools in our platform admin center. Then, if you're monitoring, it's important to understand that we also have service protection limits built in. So that means, for example, when a client application makes extraordinary demand of request, then there must be something to protect our services, correct? 
and this is what we call service protection limits. And on the data first side, there we have service protection API limits published, and you can find the link on the left bottom of the slide uh, where you see the limits that, that are currently enforced. For the finance operation apps, um, we are not there yet. At the moment, we have priority-based uh, throttling for all data and custom service requests active, but only for resource-based throttling. We are also working actively on usage-based throttling, which will light up in the next calendar year. And at that moment, we also will publish uh, protection limits. If you want to learn more about uh, priority-based throttling, you can also find the links here. If you think about maintenance, it's also you know that once you're live, your database and your data will be growing, uh, will become bigger. So it's important to also think what can be cleaned up at a certain or a regular basis. And for that, we have some built-in cleanup routines. Um, there is also a detailed docs article I refer to. I just highlight a few. Under system administration, for example, you have batch shop history cleanup, or if you use database lock functionality, and, and a lot of customers do, then it's also important that you clean up. Also for the data management, your data import export framework, it's important to take care of cleanup of some specific system tables as well as your staging tables. And then for functional side, you have for each of the areas going from GL, sales and marketing, but all over to procurement, warehouse, inventory, production and master planning, you also have specific cleanup actions. It doesn't mean that they're all applicable for your business. It's also not that they all should run on a weekly basis. So there's some more guidance in the docs article. It is important that you know that they exist and that you also implement the ones, of course, always after testing in, in the end into the production environment. And one, one remark here is if you have, of course, some, some custom processes that also maybe have some logging tables, it's important that you also work and have implemented cleanup routines for these uh, custom tables. We, of course, are aware that not everything can be cleaned up. If you think about transactional data, that's always growing. For that, um, we are working hard on archiving capabilities. So first of all, we have the Microsoft Dataverse data archival, um, and there is already a docs article out on this. So where customers will be able to select a certain root table, and then automatically all the child tables will get picked. And then at a scheduled time, then this uh, data will get moved from the primary data first to a secondary storage. And in the first release, we will support to bring your own uh, data lake as an option. But the plan is to expand the scope here for more scenarios gradually. If you think about the, if we look at the finance operation apps, we already have a few of limited archive capabilities available today for specific scenarios. If you think about archive inventory transaction and archive credit card transaction data, but these are using a different type of technology. We're actively working also for finance and operation for the finance and supply chain scenarios using then the latest technology where we archive data from FNO to the Azure Data Lake. We're also actively working on that. If you want to learn more on this, you can always ask us for a specific YAML group to be part of um, because product group is now actively working on these scenarios. And of course, input is uh, always uh, ex uh, appreciated. One more tool, Optimization Advisor. Optimization Advisors help you to ensure op optimal configuration and finds operation apps. It's like a workspace within FNO that let users like power users, but also support uh, consultants uh, in the end identify issue and in model configuration and business data. And then the Optimization Advisor suggests some best practices for model configuration and also identify business data that is obsolete or incorrect and it runs periodically it has some standard out of the box best practice rules but it's also important that you know that you can create your own rules and there's a docs article about this tool as well of how to create your own rules then about performance uh, it's not only performance is not only pre-go live performance is also important to monitor post-go live as well as when you think about uh, business expansion 
or a bigger release that you have or a country rollout with, with some bigger countries, it's really important to test and to invest in performance testing Pulse Core Live. So that's what I want to highlight here. There is a tech talk which is already a few years old, but still valid on performance testing approach. You're working on a new tech talk series on performance testing to provide more guidance. You will see that coming in the next uh, six months. Um, but for now, I just want to bring the message here that uh, always keep an eye on performance and also performance testing post go live. It's important. Do not forget. So because cloud infrastructure also needs some maintenance, we have two types of maintenance activities. We have the plant maintenance on, on a monthly basis, and then we have some critical security updates, which can happen yeah, as needed, correct? If there is a critical issue for both of them, there will be notification five business days in advance and the downtime window can vary, but here is still mentioned three hours. I'll do for the cloud infrastructure update downtime. We recently had a change because we now have a near zero downtime maintenance window. And what that means is a bit different for the interactive usage versus the batch service for the interactive usage. So users can still connect during that the maintenance is ongoing, but they can have brief disconnects like up to a minute. And on recovery, then user may experience the following. So, or the session can be recovered or the session cannot be recovered. And the error message based uh, that you will get is a bit different, correct? And you then will get redirected to, to maybe to the same workspace, but it cannot be recovered. You can only also get redirected to the home page and you maybe have to do your latest action you, you didn't finish. On the batch service, um, at the moment, the state is that for you can can become unavailable of up to 25 minutes. So that means that when you go into that servicing, then any execution batch shop will be terminated. And then there was an important message that has hopefully reached all of you is that all your batch jobs, all your also custom batch shops, we really encourage you to enable the automatic retries, correct? And there is a link downstairs in the docs article. And once you have changed your also your custom batch to enable for automatic retries, what happens then is then when the batch service becomes again available, that automatically these batch service will get restarted. If you don't want that, you still have ability then to set the max number of retries to zero, then there will be no automatic retry. But we are working even on further reducing the downtime for batch services to be even a few minutes. And for that, uh, it will require the, that customers adopt the priority based scheduling of batch shops or priority based batch scheduling. You can find the link as well here at the bottom right of the slide. It's still in preview, um, but it's important to make you familiar with it to already test it out because this will help us to even reduce further the uh, downtime window of maintenance activities. So when we do maintenance, same for LCS uh, servicing actions, also for maintenance initiated by Microsoft, there is communication coming through LCS. So both for these infrastructure updates on a monthly basis, as well for security updates in exceptional cases. So again, make sure that you get this information that somebody absorbs, absorbs it and that you take action if there is action needed. So to end this chapter uh, about maintenance, I mentioned that it's important to make yourself familiar with the different monitoring tools, not only in LCS, but also on the Power Platform Admin Center, that you also need to monitor production environments, telemetry, that you should be aware of service protection limits, also known as throttling, that you have to clean up and maintain production data periodically, and that you also have to plan for performance testing if you have a next new scope or additional uh, country go lives coming up. And the last thing is the same as for servicing that you have to read the communication from LCS and take appropriate action. So with that, um, I want to end my presentation. I would like to ask uh, maybe Feben or Christopher, is there anything important to highlight in terms of Q&A throughout the session? So we processed uh, several questions throughout your presentation. There's one about the LCS. So in environment monitoring, you have the LCS um, Azure SQL Insights. The question was, is there a plan 
the plan to get this available as an API call. For um, further troubleshooting notifications and automated um, actions, if you know. Yeah, so I'm only aware of specific API calls, but it's more on the ALM side. Uh, for this specific scenario, I'm not aware, but yeah, Christopher, if you can take a note of the email address, we could ask the program manager in this area for, for a final answer on this, I would say. Yes, it's done. Uh, I tried okay. that. Perfect. Anything else you want to highlight? Yes, we got very good feedback about the service health and the fact that LCS is not part of it. So. Uh, the the audience experienced outages and obviously with lcs there are so many things you have to do so i think maybe we need to take this to the engineering team as well so it's easy to uh, to understand if lcs faced something an issue yeah i agree i mean it's also the the on the service health you have actually the view from the outside correct and the service can be specific it can be perfectly healthy but still there could be an issue with the app itself Correct. You could face an issue with the app or you could, like you mentioned correctly, there could also be an issue with the LCS and that's also not tracked. So yeah, that's very valid feedback. Thank you. Um, maybe one additional, how to determine the used database capacity for all the environments, production and sandbox. Um, we replied and you may see already the answer, but for sandbox, you have access, right? We have a JIT access to the Azure SQL database, so you can check. For production, as of now, you don't have um, like the Azure services a report, you know, with the exact number. So if you suspect it's uh, not normal in its size, you can ever do a copy from production to your pre prod environment or tier two, three, four, five, right? Or you can open a support ticket to ask. It would be similar with um, the blob storage. Yes, I agree and I also agree it's not ideal and it's also a very common ask, correct? And it's also known to our PMs that this is missing today. And maybe one last because uh, I think it's important. It's about the, the roadmap and the timeline for um, this unified experience for the Dynamics 365 apps. So the use that is more and more close of LCS and PPAC. Do we have any, um, you know, any insights to share of what's going to come for the audience? Yeah, so we are still at the early stage, correct? And I probably some of the audience already has more details than than others. But yeah, the North Star, the end goal is, of course, that everything will go into uh, the same portal, correct? And that will be Power Platform Admin Center. So that's also why there is limited investment, I would say, in LCS tools. Like if you just mentioned also the storage quota and so on. Yeah, obviously that will in the future then light up as well under quotas in the Power Platform Admin Center. So that's the North Star we're aiming for, but the exact timelines, I don't think we, we can share here at the moment. Yes, and thanks for that. And as I communicated in the, the answer, uh, our goal is to use these tech talks to quickly tell you what's important to know in terms of impacts and changes. So do not hesitate to register to the tech talks. So if tomorrow we get um, concrete information about this unification, uh, you are the first to be aware of it. And that yeah, would this be is, maybe. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so this will be obviously an area like every area I would say that will change again in the coming six months to 12 months properly. But the current tech talk we had out was, I think a few years old, was definitely outdated. So I think this one is a lot more updated and current. But uh, yeah, Christopher is right. Always be also aware about the, and make yourself aware you know, of the most recent communications we will do. And at a certain time, we will also again renew then this tech talk, correct? If there are too many changes compared to what we have presented today. 
So anyhow, I would really like to, to thank you today for listening into this tech talk to ask your questions. If you still have questions, please, you can still ask now and, and we will still answer them. Just stay in the in the chat then after we, we end now the tech talk. So but for now, I would like to thank you all. I want to give back the word to, to Tim. Tim, back to you. Thank you, Davey. I have posted a link to a short survey in the Q&A panel. We'd love to hear your feedback on today's session, as well as hear what you'd like to see in future sessions. Thank you for your participation today. As a reminder, the recording of today's session will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. I'd like to once again extend a big thank you to our presenter today, Davey Fliegen, uh, and to our audience for joining us. Have a good rest of the day ahead.